Good morning. I think I know everybody, but I'm Wes, one of the pastors here. Nice to see you. Uh, we're going to do what we do each Sunday now, look at a passage from God's Word. We'll talk about what it means and why it matters and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible with you today, a uh, Bible app, anything to access the Scriptures, if you turn to Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1, and when you found that, if you're able, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? Genesis 15, starting at verse 1. You read this. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur, of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these to him, cut them in two, and arranged them in halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that if for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, they will be enslaved and mistreated. There. He's referring now to people enslaved in Egypt before the Exodus. I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its measure. When the sun had set and darkness was, had faded or had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river and the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kedamites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Gigashites, and Jebusites. A lot of ites there. That's God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us quickly, and then we'll dive into this together. Spirit of God, uh, we ask that you would illumine the preaching of your word. And I'm asking you to come and move powerfully among us today in this gathering of your people. You tell us that when you send out your word, it doesn't return to you void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you send it. God, accomplish that purpose in each one here gathered today. And as I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Anyone else remember that? Anyone else remember repeating that happy little rhyme as a kid when you wanted to leave no doubt in the minds of your friends that you were telling the truth? Cross my heart, hope to die. We had little action, stick a needle in my eye. Um, there, there's a lot of different <laughs> theories as to the origin of that saying as a whole. Um, cross my heart almost certainly has a Roman Catholic origin, as in like making the sign of the cross over your heart. This idea really kind of almost like the same as saying, I swear on the Bible, this idea of saying, like, I, I so want you to believe, I'm attesting to the validity of the claim that I'm being made by saying this. So it's like, as God, or, or as God's word is true, so is this promise I'm making. We're kind of equating the two. They're both equally true. That's what we're saying with that. Funny story, as I was thinking about this, I'm such a Protestant kid growing up. Whenever we did that, we would do this. We'd made like an X on our chest. Cross my heart, tell like one of my friends who was Catholic, he's like, I think it's this, actually. Like, why are you making an X? Anyway, 
I found that funny. Um, but then, along with cross my heart, hope to die. Stick a needle in my eye. Um, I always thought that was about like torture of some kind. Apparently, at some point in history, it was common practice to stick a needle into the eye of a corpse before burying it in order to ensure that it was truly dead uh, before they buried them. Smart idea. Um, some fun history for you there. Um, but then adding, so really adding the direst of consequences, death, death to the promise of truthfulness as well. So now, not only am I saying that God's word is untrue, if what I'm saying is found to be false, I, I'd be willing to actually die if I'm found to be lying. Okay, now how willing any of us who use that phrase would have been to actually follow through on those consequences if it was found that we were lying? Yeah, that's another matter entirely. But uh, I bring it up because uh, far more than just making a, a promise or a vow, a statement like this is intended to inspire belief uh, or trust in another person by providing even greater security than a promise alone. Uh, so so it's, it's almost like a contract. You're laying out the consequences that can be enacted as well, should uh, whatever I'm being promised here remain unfulfilled or undelivered. And this greater security, I think entirely understandably, that Abram, later called Abraham, apparently needed as well in response to God's promises that he made to him back in chapter 12 to give him a land of his own and make him into a nation as numerous as the stars in the sky. He needed this greater security as well. For a while, the promise of giving him this land, that was hard enough. At 75 years of age, his wife is 65 at this time, still childless, the promise of making him into a great nation uh, all the world being blessed through his offspring seemed infinitely harder, if not impossible, to keep. So he needed that, that sense of like greater security than just a promise. But as we'll see from our passage this morning as we go through this, it was security that Abraham needed not just because he had doubts about God's ability to follow through on what he promised. He also had doubts about his own ability to follow through on the obedience that he'd promised to God. And it's in response to both of those doubts, really, but actually to Abram's doubts about his own ability to be faithful in particular, that God provides this greater security for him by laying out the terms of this contract, what the Bible refers to as a covenant, which ultimately spells out the consequences that God agrees can be enacted on him should the promise of land and offspring for Abram remain unfulfilled and undelivered. It's what I want to look at together with you for just a few minutes this morning from our passage. As we continue on in this teaching series we began a few weeks ago entitled Origin Story, which as we've been saying is all about growing in our appreciation for and understanding of the New Testament story of Jesus by spending some time to unpack and look at the origin of that story from the Old Testament. So far we've looked at the origin of everything, the origin of us, the origin of rest, Last Sunday, Pastor Dave led us through looking at the origin of sin. But today, we'll look at the origin of covenant and how God works through covenant making in order to bring about greater belief and trust in his promises. Another cool thing is actually we'll see how this origin story actually helps prepare our entire understanding of Jesus' death, which we're going to be commemorating again in a few weeks' time with the celebration of Easter. In order to help you see all of this, just get a, a grasp of it and really understand what it means and why it matters in how we respond to the promises of God, I want to look at our passage today in just two ways. We're going to look at the power of faith and then the purpose of covenant. Just those two things. Power of faith, purpose of covenant. So if you close your Bibles, Bible app, whatever you got, if you could open it again to that passage, Genesis 15, beginning at verse 1, follow along with me as we look at the origin of covenant. Okay, so let's look first of all at the power of faith. The power of faith. And we didn't cover this part of the story. We sort of just leapt into chapter 15. But if you're unfamiliar with the Bible in general, or the Old Testament in particular, just for context, a few chapters earlier, as we said, Genesis 12, God uh, it's where we're first introduced to this guy named Abram, uh, an elderly 
man uh, from a place called Ur, which is located in modern-day Iraq. God comes to him one day and tells him, leave your homeland, leave your father's household, and go to a place that I will show you with this promise attached, should he obey. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on the earth earth will be blessed through you. So again, 75 years of age, Abram sets out with his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot to go to this land that God has promised to show him. But by the time we get to our passage in Genesis 15, 10 years have actually elapsed between God's making of that promise and now. Ten years, yet he and his wife remain childless. Which is just to say, I think it's not without good reason that at 85 now, Abraham is genuinely struggling to believe the promises of God to him. Right? You see in verse 2 and 3 here, he's beginning to become even just resigned to the fact that God's not going to be faithful to the promise. And so he's going to likely need to adopt one of his servants to be his heir because, you know, it seems pretty clear God's not going to follow through on that promise. But I want to pause here for just a minute before we look at God's response to Abram's question because something really important to notice quickly from our passage is that I want you to look here. Look both here as well as again in verse 8. When Abram comes to God with these questions, not once, at no time does God respond to Abram's questions and his doubts with anger, with outrage, with this sort of like, how dare you question me, question my integrity. No, each time, instead, he responds instead with reassurance. He he responds by giving greater security. Here, let me show you you can trust me. I think it's so important for us to just pause and really recognize because far too often, maybe from like a misunderstanding of the Bible, maybe you grew up in like super authoritarian homes or churches, or or maybe just as a result of bad teaching, uh, we, we can all have this idea that struggles, doubts we have with God must never be spoken or shared with anyone. You've got you to keep that to yourself. Don't share that with other people. Certainly don't bring that to God. I'm, I'm struggling with what's going on here. I don't, this doesn't seem good. I don't like what's happening. You could never bring those kinds of doubts and questions to God. I, think, I, hope, I hope what you can see already from our passage is that genuine questions brought to God, what's sometimes referred to as faith-seeking understanding, is, is always appropriate. It's always welcomed. He, he wants us to come to him with those things. And man, I, I hope we'd be a church that demonstrates that same openness to questions and doubts and struggles as well as, as we're all just seeking together to learn what does it mean to know and follow God. I hope we can be a place like that where it's safe to do that. Okay, but let's jump back in. Look, look here at God's gracious faith-building response to Abram's question in verse 4. God says, this man, this Eliezer guy, will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So, so in a sense, it's almost as if God is saying, Abram, Abram, listen, just stop, okay? Just pause. Um, you, don't, uh, you don't need to come up with a plan B for me. You don't need to do all this orchestrating uh, of whatever uh, in order to cover for what looks like my unfaithfulness to the promise. Adoption, it's a great thing, wonderful thing. That's not going to be part of your story. Uh, uh, You're going to have an heir that's your own flesh and blood. And then, I see in verse 5, look here, God actually doubles down on the promise to Abram, taking him outside, inviting him, look up at the stars and try to count them if you're able, and then adding this incredible assurance, see all that? So shall your offspring be. Wow. An exercise which evokes what feels like the most unexpected response from Abram. Because if you think about it, as one commentator put it, like just, just inviting Abram to come out, like pointing him to look at the stars, that doesn't actually prove or verify anything. You don't validate a promise by making an even bigger one. And yeah, look at this. Look at verse 6. All of a sudden, now, Abram believes God. 
uh, he, he puts his faith, God will surely keep his promise, and he will have a flesh and blood heir in his lifetime. Which, if you're at all like me, uh, as, as wonderful as that is, is leaving me just standing there saying, like, sorry, what? <laughs> huh? That's it? You just believe now? How? How? how what changed? Well, I like, I like Walter Brueggemann's answer to that question of how Abram moves from this place of doubt to a posture of faith, saying, what moved Abram to a new response? Surely it's not because he feels new generative powers in his loins, nor because he has new expectations for his wife. No, the new promise for his life is not any expectation of flesh and blood. Rather, he has come to rely on the promise of the speaker. That is, he has now permitted God to be not a hypothesis about the future, but the voice around which his life is organized. He goes on, In short, Abram has repented. He's abandoned a reading of reality which is measured by what he can see and touch and manage. This new orientation is not a generalized religious notion that everything will work out all right. Rather, it's a specific response to a concrete promise from a known promise maker. Which I suppose still leaves us with the question like, okay, great, cool, but like, how did he come to that place of repentance? How did he get there? What brought him to this new orientation? What was it about God taking him out to look up at a starry sky that so radically changed him? Well, it's not everything, but I wonder if what moved Abram from a place of doubt to a posture of faith wasn't the extravagant, the extravagance of God's response to his request for a child. I think that's what so changed him that suddenly he believed, the extravagance of God's response to his request for a child. That when Abram brings his doubt to God about his, his promise to produce a flesh and blood heir, God's response is, ass is essentially just to say, oh, is that all? That, that's, you think... That's asking too much of me? Come here. Come outside with me. Look up at the stars and try to count them, Abram. That's the size and the scope of what I'm going to accomplish through you. This reminds me of a quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon, imagining the voice of God in response to our many prayers every day, imagining God responding this way, if you had need of a thousand times as much help, I would give it to you. You require little compared to what I'm ready to give. Now, okay, sure, God's extravagant response ups the level of expectation dramatically, right? Which is why it would be wise uh, for you and me never to respond to someone's doubts about our ability to keep a promise by doing this. But, but yet so assured is God of his extravagant ability to provide for his children, He's unworried in the slightest about extravagant promising. And it's not the point of this message. It's not where I'm going, but I think it's worth just pausing to ask you, like, what are you praying for right now? What's the need that you're bringing to God right now? I wonder if today you might hear his extravagant response to you. That I, I want to do, well, as Paul describes it, abundantly more, immeasurably more than you can even ask or imagine me to ask. That's all you need? I pray you'd hear his extravagant response to you today. And that it would create faith in you. But beyond the creation of faith in Abraham's heart and mind, I think one of the most powerful transformational things about this passage so far is what Abram's faith is said to produce. Look again at verse 6. It says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Righteousness, meaning God's perfect, guiltless, moral standing to stand that way before a holy, sinless God. Something that no one since Adam and Eve before the fall could have ever been described as, Abram here achieves simply as the result of his faith and trust in God. He hasn't done anything yet. He believes God and he now has that perfect 
moral standing that we were initially created with before God. And man, there's volumes that have been and could be written about all of this. But in the simplest terms, what you need to know is that this one verse, Genesis 15, 6, is actually the origin of the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith alone. That's it right here. As the Apostle Paul, later in Romans chapter 4, picks up on this promise of God to Abraham from this origin story and concludes this way. What shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? In fact, Abraham was justified by works if he was, sorry, what was I saying? Abraham was justified by works if he was. He had something to boast about, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited to them as righteousness. Jump down to verse 18. Against all hope, Abram in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver in unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, listen, but also for us. To whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who's raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Derek Kidner, kind of drawing these two things together, says this story, our passage today, and the argument of Romans 4 present faith not as a crowning merit, but as readiness to accept what God produced, what God promises. It's a good way to think about faith, a readiness to accept what God promises, which is really the call and the comfort of the message of the Bible to every single one of us today. That peace with God, restored relationship after our separation from Him that every one of us experienced after the Garden of Eden has nothing to do with our religious efforts, how hard you can try and work, keeping the rules well enough, but entirely in our trust in His promises. That's what's required for that restored relationship. That's it. Readiness to accept what God promises, which in the case of salvation means faith in his promise that the work of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is fully sufficient, is all that is needed to pay our debt and restore us back to relationship with him. As Paul concludes, Romans 116, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, which is what? God's, God's promise of what the work of Jesus has accomplished for us. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That's the power of a faith. Trust in the promises of God, and it results in our righteousness or our right standing with God. So the question for all of us to consider that in light of God's extravagant promise of a restored relationship by faith alone is this, are you resting by faith in the promises of God, like our father Abram, the father of our faith, to root and establish your renewed relationship with the God who made you, or are you still striving to accomplish in your own efforts what has already been accomplished for you in the finished work of Jesus? Faith is all that's required. There's nothing more to be done. That's the power of faith. This, this incredible truth that just our faith alone in the promises of God has the power to secure our salvation and a restored relationship with God for all time. Last thing I want to look at together with you is the purpose of covenant. What's the purpose of covenant? And we need to look at this covenant in particular because, man, wow, if you thought that Abram's response to God was unexpected. God's response to Abram now is going to blow your mind. Look now at verse 7. God is, is re referring back to this original call he gave to Abram in Genesis 12. 
identifies him as the one who, who led him to leave his homeland to this land that he was to inherit. But then in response, we see Abram say this, verse 8, look here. God says, here's the land that I've, I've led you to take possession of. But then Abram says, sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? Which at first seems like he's already lost whatever faith and trust in God he had one verse ago. And we're kind of just like, well, wow, that was quick. And, you know, full disclosure, like that is how faith goes sometimes, right? Particularly in a crisis. It can literally be like, I trust you. Oh, I don't trust you. I trust you. Like it can be like that. I get it. But it does seem quick. Like he literally just said he believes God. And now he's like, yeah, but how, how is that going to happen? And yet as you look more closely, I think you begin to see there may be something else going on behind Abram's doubts here. Tim Keller in his own work on this passage puts it like this. God says, I'm giving you this land if you walk before me and obey me. Therefore, now Abram is filled with doubts, but they're not quite the same. Listen to this. Before, Abram said, you made this promise to me, but how can I be sure you'll keep it? I have doubts about you. Now, he says, we have this agreement in which I have to obey you, and you'll give me this land. But how can I know whether I will come through? How can I know if I'm going to be up to the task? What he's actually saying is, I have doubts about me. So Abram believes God now as it relates to his ability to do what he's promised to do. That's what we saw in verse 6. It's credited to him or counted to him as righteousness. What he's most concerned about now is his own ability to follow through on the terms of their agreement. And so, as we see in verse 9 and following, God's response to Abram's fears is to draw up a covenant agreement between the two of them. That's what's going on with these animals that God asks Abram to gather. And then he sets them up in this particular way. And man, there's a lot we could say about everything going on here. This is obviously a different kind of contractual setup. than It's very different than anything we're familiar with today. I mean, you can imagine like buying a house and the realtor takes you outside and there's like animals cut in half. And he's like, I'm just going to ask you to walk through these in order to be sure you're going to pay for the house. Like, we'd be like, wow, what? We don't do this today, but this is a very common, understood way of setting a covenant in, in these times. So that's what's going on. In the simplest of terms, this aisle of animal parts, um, in order to bring about that greater security than just a vow or promising a loan could bring, which we talked about earlier, the two parties in the covenant would walk between the pieces of the animals as a kind of enacted curse, So it was saying, if if I don't keep to the terms of our agreement, may I be torn apart like these animals. That's what you were doing by walking between the pieces. That's exactly what's going on here. The only difference being that in cases like this, when there was a strong power differential, like a king or a nobleman was entering into a covenant with one of his subjects or someone who just wanted to lease the land, the expectation was only that the lower party, would walk through the pieces as, you know, the king was already being gracious in being willing to enter into a covenant agreement with you. That's what Abraham understands God is doing here. He's like, okay, I think I understand what you're doing. Maybe he thinks God wants to help create a deeper security in my abilities to follow through on these promises by upping the stakes, by by bringing about this, this greater uh, terms of, of weight to our agreement so that I'll feel like, okay, I know what I promised and I don't want that to happen to me, so thanks God for, for setting this up. And then when you get to verse 17, what you see God doing instead, breaking all expectations of what the greater party in a covenant like, covenant like this was expected to do, is God walking through the pieces himself. That, that's what's going on when you see this smoking fire pot and blazing torch going through the pieces. These were the the symbols by which God represented himself later uh, as the people of Israel are going through the wilderness. They're led by this pillar of fire and cloud. The same thing here. These are the symbols. That's what we're seeing going through the thing, taking the penalties of the curse upon himself. Saying to Abram, if I don't bless you like I promised, may I be killed and torn to pieces just like these animals. So again, that's just it's unfathomable that, that the greater party in a covenant like this would take those kind of curses on himself. It was only the, the lower party who would do this. 
Here the, the king of kings and lord of lords now takes those curses upon himself should he not be faithful. And yet what's even more unfathomable than this even is what happens and we read immediately following in verse 18. Look, God passes through the pieces and then it says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I will give this land. Notice anything missing? Right? It's unfathomable. God would walk through the pieces, taking these curses upon himself. Who doesn't walk through? Abram. See, no record of him ever being asked to walk through the pieces, which means, again, as Keller summarizes so masterfully, what God is saying by walking through the pieces himself but not requiring Abram to walk through them is this. Not only will I pay the penalty if I'm not faithful to the covenant, I will pay the penalty if you're not faithful to the covenant because your faithfulness has nothing to do with this blessing. This blessing is coming to you unconditionally. And I will be torn to pieces if necessary if either I fail or you fail. I'll be torn to pieces so I'll still be able to bless you. Which means the purpose of this covenant in particular is not only to create greater security in Abram as it relates to God keeping his promises, it's, it's primarily to create greater security in Abram as it relates to his own ability to be faithful. As God covenants to take on the penalties for promise breaking should either one of them fail. A covenant agreement, and I'll close with this, that perfectly mirrors as well as prepares our hearts and minds to better understand exactly what Jesus does for the world, taking on human flesh and then offering it up on the cross. There's, there's so many parallels between these two passages, it's almost uncanny. Even uh, as Mark's gospel reminds us in Mark 15, after Jesus has been beaten, flogged, had his flesh torn open as nails are driven through his hands and feet on the cross, we're told darkness comes over the whole land just as it did for Abram here when God cuts this covenant with him. It's, it's those, those details are meant to draw our minds to like look back and remember when that happened. When did darkness come over the whole land? Right when God made that covenant with Abram. And then just listen to the way that Isaiah describes what Jesus was experiencing at that moment as he's literally torn to pieces, not for his own breaking of the covenant, but for yours and for mine. Writing, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. And when his soul makes an offering for guilt, look, he shall see his offspring. As numerous as the stars in the sky. Out of the anguish of his soul we shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall this righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Which means what we see and celebrate at Easter is Jesus' death is actually the faithfulness of God to the covenant he made with Abram. As he takes on the penalty for our covenant breaking in himself and so that he can continue to bless us. I don't know where you're at in your relationship with God today. Um, maybe for some of you, that relationship has yet to begin because, like Abram, you're not sure if God can be trusted to be faithful to his promises. Is he really going to come through like he said he would? My prayer for you today is that if that's where you're at, you might see through God's cutting of the covenant with Abraham here and then being willing to take those penalties upon himself 
just how serious he is about creating that even greater sense of security than a promise alone can create. And that in seeing that today, you might respond to him in faith. Maybe for others today, your concern isn't at all about God's ability to keep his promises. You're more worried about your own. You're like, why would God ever want to enter into a relationship like that with me? I, I've, I've shown again and again, I can't, I can't follow what he calls me to do. Why would he even want to start with me? I've failed him now in so many times and ways there's not hope for someone like me. If that's where you're at today, my prayer is that in seeing the unconditional nature of God's covenant, how, how he actually pays the penalty for all your covenant breaking himself, it might create hope in you once again for what's possible. Lastly, if you're here today and like so many of us in the church, you feel like, okay, I, I do have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. I, I believe that's true, and yet... At some point in time, again, like so many of us, you've picked up the crushing burden of trying to earn that relationship once again. And the way you know that is when you feel like God is more pleased with you when you're keeping the rules well enough and that he's somehow displeased or he's distancing himself from you whenever you fail. That's how you know if you've returned to trying to earn that relationship again. That's where you're at today. I pray that, this, again, this same unconditional nature of God's covenant would also create renewed faith in you to believe that while our obedience to God should be the increasing result of a relationship with Him, it never was, nor will it ever be, the basis for it. Our obedience to God is our response to the relationship we have with Him, not the thing that creates it. As the author of Hebrews so perfectly states, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, that body which was torn just as the temple curtain was torn into. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Why? For he who promised is faithful. Amen. Amen.